been six months since I felt your touch. Back then, I was a different person, and you were something new. A fresh start, a new beginning, and my oh my, what joy you brought me. You felt right. Oh, so right. Everyone would tell me about how flawed you were, but I didn't care. I could see some of your flaws and weaknesses, but to me, you were beautiful, blemishes and all. I loved the evenings I would waste away with you until the early morning hours. We'd stay up so late that I would be exhausted at work the next day, but I didn't care. You were worth it. And then, time moved on and we grew apart. Looking back on it, it was my fault. It always was. You had plenty more to give me with shiny hunting and VGC, but I turned away. I had my fun and so I left you in the cold and moved on to my other flames. I can't help but think about you. I hear you fixed yourself up a little, had some bugs fixes and patches, and you've even got some new content on the way. I see the fun you're having with all the competitive players and it makes my skin itch for what we had and what we could have had. So, will you take me back? Pokemon Scarlet and Violet released on November 18th, 2022, and like normal, the new generation of Pokemon caused an internet uproar. Pokemon fans are kind of notoriously unpleasable. I don't think there has been an uncontroversial generation of Pokemon games, honestly, ever. You have the satanic panic that consumed the early days of Pokemon. Ruby and Sapphire caused a stir because Pokemon couldn't be transferred up from older games. Generation 5 was hated at first because everyone said the Pokemon designs were bad. For the record, I love Gen 5 and always have. For Gen 6, people were upset with the move to 3D, and I was one of them. Generation 7 and Gen 8 also both stirred up a fair share of their own controversies. Point is that Pokemon games always cause a stir and Generation 9 was no different. Like you could probably gleam from my intro, I liked Scarlet and Violet at launch, but they were no doubt filled with issues and I couldn't honestly disagree with any of the critiques being laid at the games. Scarlet and Violet made some huge strides and big first steps in the Pokemon franchise, but at the same time they were still littered with all of the issues that have plagued the Pokemon series. Taking one look at the game's Metacritic page will tell you the whole story. Pokemon Scarlet has a critic score of 7.2, yet a user score of 3.3. I may have really enjoyed my time with the new generation 9 games, but it's very clear that a large portion of the fan base was very unhappy with them. Well, it's been six months since Scarlet and Violet released. Definitely hasn't been seven months. Uh, this, this video's definitely not late or anything. I'm not changing the title. I want to go back and revisit these games to see where the truth really lies. The hype is gone and so is the rage that came with it. These games are also no longer brand new on store shelves, so I think it's a great time to get a clear picture of how these games actually stack up. I remember that day we met, November 18th, 2022. I was with two of my friends when we met, and by the end of the night, we were all tag teaming you at the same time. The energy was like nothing I felt, and I miss it. Oh my god, it's you! You came! For this video, I bought Pokemon Scarlet. I purchased Violet at launch, so it just makes sense for me to get Scarlet for the video. This means that I spent 60 bucks on this video and I'm not even monetized yet, so please, please subscribe. Like with most Pokemon games, the only real version differences are the Pokemon you can obtain. There are smaller changes, like in Violet, there is a lot more purple, whereas Pokemon Scarlet has a lot more red and oranges. Ultimately though, they're fundamentally the same besides those few differences. There's always a trade-off when picking a Pokemon game. You have to check out what Pokemon are exclusive to each game and then pick the game with the better set of exclusive Pokemon for your specific taste. Or hell, maybe you pick purely based off the box legendary. That's what I did for Sword and Shield. I wanted the Sword Dog. For me though, this is how I picked this time around for Scarlet and Violet. Does it come in purple? Yeah, on launch day I got Violet because purple is my favorite color. Sue me. This is not an actual invitation to sue Sweet Dreams. He is in fact very broke and his student loans to pay off so your lawsuit would just be a waste of time and money for both parties. Please direct all lawsuits to any other YouTuber. Also, you have stinky ass feet. Once I had Scarlet downloaded, I opened up the game, made my character, and the game began. The game opens with a nice cutscene introducing us to the school and the game's map. Now this cutscene is nice for only half of it. Once we meet Director Clavel and get the iconic first look at a Pokemon in the games, the cutscene changes from animated scenes to still screenshots. Legitimately in the first three minutes of the game, Scarlet and Violet's quality issues are front and center. It does go back to some animated scenes after this, but the still screenshots mixed in just feels so insanely lazy. Like you really couldn't animate or render all of these scenes? I'll admit that while my professional job is in the tech field, I have zero clue on the details and work that goes into making a game, and I also don't understand the Switch's graphical capacity in a meaningful way. Even with my lack of technical understanding, I as a gamer feel frustrated when I see things like this. 
it does feel lazy. Maybe the creators were legitimately limited by the Switch, but to me, it feels much more like that the release date was approaching for Scarlet and Violet, and so some elements got dumbed down. Again, I don't know. This is me purely sharing the impression I get from this. Moving forward, we get a cutscene where the box legend flies around the region, and this is honestly great. It's pretty hyped to see the new region, some of the new Pokemon, the school, and especially the box legend. After the legendary Pokemon crashes, the camera moves on to the player's house. Your home in Scarlet and Violet is actually super cozy and nice. I really liked it too. It's too bad most environment doesn't have this kind of cozy or nice vibe. Some definitely do, but most feel empty and boring, but I'm getting ahead of myself here. Director Clavel comes to speak with your mother and then the game does something absolutely egregious. It makes me put on a fucking hat. Hey, are we gonna have a fucking problem? Cause it seems to me like we're gonna have a fucking problem. I spent time picking a nice hairstyle that I liked, and then the game's just like, no, put that ponytail away, here's a fucking hat. Honestly, I didn't like the girl character's hat. It makes the character look super androgynous to me, which is fine, there's nothing wrong with being androgynous. I just didn't want my character to be androgynous. I also couldn't remember how to change your clothes in order to take the hat off, because I never used the clothes features for my playthrough of Violet at all, and I didn't feel like looking it up, so I just stopped caring about it. For the record, it's on the D-pad on the Switch, and I did eventually take the hat off. Once you've got your bag and godforsaken hat, Director Clavel introduces you to the three starters of the region. So let's talk about the Paldean starters. We have Sprigagito, Foycoco, and Quaxley. We first met these Pokemon in February of 2022 when these games were first announced. The trailer showed off footage of Pokemon roaming around the Paldea region, but the most important thing was revealed at the very end. We got to see the first form starters and it made me extremely excited. I did a video series last fall about Pokemon and part two focuses on the games and the role they played in my personal life. I go into much more detail in that video, but to make a long story short, Sword and Shield re-sparked my interest in Pokemon after a couple of years of not being very involved with the community. Sword and Shield have flaws, but I enjoyed them. Legends Arceus I really loved, a good bit more than Sword and Shield for sure. Generations 6 and 7 both hurt me for different reasons and so it felt exciting to feel like Pokemon was headed in the right direction again. When these starters got revealed, my hopes got even higher. These first forms are gas, people. Sprigagito and Foycoco are the cutest things to ever exist. Quaxley in his own right has a great style and personality to the Pokemon's design. From what I recall, the general vibe on the internet was a hopeful one. People liked these first forms a lot. There was a large movement that wanted Sprigagito to stay on four legs for once, and I was one of them. As we all know, it didn't. The final forms of the starters I do think are good. I do wish Meowscrata had a more cat focused design rather than going into the magician look, but that being said, I do like Meowscrata. Skeledurge I think is the best final design out of the starters. However, Skeledurge has an issue that many fire type starters have in Pokemon. A repetitive typing. Fire Ghost is a really great type combo, but we just got a Fire Ghost starter in Legends Arceus with the new Typhlosion form. Skeledurge is only the second time we've seen this typing with a starter Pokemon, but still. It's frustrating to me that there are so many unused type combos for the starter Pokemon. I would much rather see a unique and more interestingly designed Pokemon gameplay wise rather than a repeated type combo that is known to do good and synergize well. I'd rather see a fire bug type starter or a fire rock type or a fire steel type starter. Or fine, why not just say fuck it and go for a fourth fire fighting type starter? Why does this issue just plague the fire type starters? The grass and water starters have a much better history of doing unique and new type combos with their starters. Meowscarada and Coquavo both have new typings for their starter Pokemon. Why the fuck can't Skeledurge? Sure, with a different typing, it'd likely have to be designed differently, but I don't really care about that. Anyways, besides this annoying issue, Skeledurge is a great starter. Foy Coco is probably the cutest starter ever with its dopey ass face, and the overall design of Skeledurge reminds me more of older Pokemon, whereas the other two designs are more in line with Gen 7 and Gen 8 starter Pokemon. Quaquabble is my least favorite of the three. Sorry, Quaxley fans, but that being said, I don't dislike this line at all. I think they're fine enough starters. I just think they have an ugly ass haircut. Question. 
Could you repeat what you just said about my hair, sir? In all honesty, I actually like the pompadour style on this Pokemon line. It gives the Pokemon some character, and I also really like how gay this duck is in its final evolution. Overall, I lump all three starters in a similar bin of quality. They each float between a 7 and an 8 out of 10 for me personally. Back to the game, I think the interactions you have with the starters at the beginning are super cute. It's fun to be able to walk around with the starters for a little, and the short cutscenes we get with each of them are also a nice touch. After this, you get to meet Nimona, your rival, who we will discuss later, and then you get to pick your starter. When I originally played Violet, I went with Sprigagito because the weed cat is cute. This time around, I went with Foy Coco. I nicknamed him Butters because, well, to be honest, Foy Coco's innocent, trusting, and sweet face just reminded me of Butters from South Park. Oh, you're a bit shelly. I mean, even the hair matches. I will not be evolving Butters either. That name just doesn't fit any of the evolutions as well as it fits Little Foy Coco. After your typical rival battle and catching tutorial, you're off. Well, not really. On the way to school, your character and Nimona hear a Pokemon's roar and go off to investigate. While doing so, your character falls to the death and in the afterlife, they meet the box legendary. For me, this time around, it was of course Coridon. Now this Pokemon is hurt when you find them, so you feed them the sandwich your mom made you and they're up and ready to go. In order to get out, you have to make your way through a dangerous cave, but with the legendary's help, it's no issue. After this, you meet the Pokemon's caretaker, Arvin, who we will also talk about later. He ends up handing off the legendary Pokemon to you, but you can't ride it yet, or use it for that matter. Now you're actually off. Your first stop is Mezagoza, where the academy is located. The school has a different name based on what version you're playing. Naranja Academy for me, since I'm playing through Scarlet this time. Mezagoza is a cool city. I really think this might easily be the most memorable town in Scarlet and Violet. I don't really remember many of the towns and that's coming from someone who just beat the game for a second time. We'll swing back around to that later. Once you make it to the school, you meet your third rival-like character for Gen 9, Penny. Penny and Arvin aren't really rivals as much as Nimona is, but you still have big battles with them at the end, and Penny and Arvin are definitely important to Scarlet and Violet. This isn't like Generation 6, where you immediately forgot about 75% of the rival character cast the second you close the game. When we meet Penny, she's being harassed by some Team Star members, who we will also circle back to. We need to get through this goddamn game intro before we dive into anything. So then I told him he could take his dick and suck it himself, you know what I'm saying? Babe, can we please just enjoy this fancy dinner I put together for us before we talk about our relationship? It's just been so long since I've seen you, you know? After besting those Team Star grunts, it's off the homeroom where you're introduced to the school and where I can't not point out the absolutely horrible frame rate whenever you're in a classroom scene. We're going to talk about the performance issues and the graphics later, but I can't not point this part out. Nimona, the teacher, and you are the only models that don't run at like four frames a second. Anyway, from here, you have to go around the school learning about the various challenges and gyms you'll be faced with. The last little part of this intro here makes me grind my teeth. It's fine, and all it's doing is setting up your goals as a player, but at this point you've been playing for an hour to an hour and a half and I'm just ready to fucking play. On launch day, I wanted to do multiplayer with friends and we did, but the issue is the super long game opening really cut into our playtime together. It made it so I just had to sit around and wait for my friends to catch up. I had made it all the way to the point where the game opens up to the full open world experience, but one friend didn't know that he needed to do that and the other friend stopped way too early thinking that was the point he needed to get to. This was most definitely mostly our fault for planning and communicating poorly, but it still frustrated me a lot and kind of soured the intro a little bit for me. On this playthrough though, I was much, much less eager to jump into these games because I've played them before, so I was able to sit back and enjoy it more. That being said, this time around, I really didn't pay any attention to the dialogue. Scarlet and Violet make massive improvements in the writing department for Pokemon games, but it still doesn't make me want to re-meet all these characters again. I'm ready to play Pokemon, damn it! So babe, you wanna have some fun tonight? You're never in the mood anymore. Do you even like me? See, we're back to our old issues. You don't talk to me. Just tell me what's wrong. The game doesn't edge you for too much longer. Soon after all that stuff in the school, Father Pucci activates Made in Heaven. Made in Heaven! 
This is just a time skip to your treasure hunt. This is a time of open study for the academy students. Each student is given the free roam of the Paldea region and they're tasked with focusing on whatever they want to focus on with Pokemon. For you, the player, it means the game can actually start. This is also when you finally unlock the ride feature for your box legendary. The ride feature is awesome. To start, you can only ride your box legend, but as you take down the various titans around the region, your box legendary will gain new movement abilities. I'll talk about all that when we address the Titans. What I want to address very first is the game's open world. Scarlet and Violet are the first real open world Pokemon games. With the exception of one or two loading screens, you can free roam and even fly across large portions of the map. Sword and Shield took the first steps toward an open world when they included the wild area. It was pretty far from being an open world, but it was still the first step. Then in Legends Arceus, we got another step forward. In Legends Arceus, you have your main hub town, but then you have five Five large open areas outside of that. The areas are all disconnected though and you do have to navigate through loading screens and menus to get between each town and area. Scarlet and Violet though are the real deal. Open world baby! Oh great, now you want to go and open the relationship. Open world is an important step for Pokemon. The idea of being able to run around this incredible world filled to the brim with a booming ecosystem of Pokemon is really appealing. Scarlet and Violet does capture the majority of this feeling in my opinion. Most of the Pokemon have unique reactions to the player approaching. Paldea and Taurus will charge the player, many timid Pokemon will fly off, run, or hide from the player, and others will just walk up and stare at you. I like the way the Pokemon themselves react to the player. Each Pokemon acts in a way that helps give life to the Pokemon and the environments. Sadly though, one thing that did take a hit with the game being open world is the environments. I struggled to think of what to say about the game's environments and I think the reason why is because they're just kind of there. I don't think they're bad, in fact I think some areas are kind of nice, yet at the same time a lot of areas are very bland. It's kind of a mixed bag to be totally honest with you. There are things you can definitely criticize, but I think a majority of those criticisms lie in the graphics department and I am not about to open that can of worms right now. As far as the environments themselves go, only a couple stand out in my memory. Mostly in the top left section of the map where things go all autumn-y. Past that, there really isn't much else to say. The whole right side of the map, there's not a ton I could tell you about it besides there being a desert area here and a bamboo forest here. Past that, there really isn't much else to say. With all of that being said, I don't think the environments are inherently bad either. They're designed to work well with Coridon and Maridon's various movement abilities, and they're reasonably fun to navigate and explore. The environments are no doubt barren and bland in a lot of cases, if not most cases, but I think that's a result of whatever caused the graphics to look the way they do. Definitely uninteresting in some sections, but overall, I think the environments in Scarlet and Violet are passable. One important thing that the open Open world does do for Pokemon is it allows for you to tackle the gyms and other objectives in any order that you would like. Well, kind of. Yes, you can go to gyms 6, 7, or 8 first if you really want to, but they'll be much stronger than you and will crush you. I do want to talk about the game's difficulty and level scaling, but I feel like we need to discuss some of the actual game first. For my second playthrough, I went to the first gym first. I know you can go anywhere, I literally just said that, but level wise, the bug gym is the lowest and the clear first intended objective. For my first playthrough after the game's launch, I went right of Mezagoza and went after Cloth very first. That meant that by the time I got back to the other side of the map where the bug gym is and took care of all that, I was very over leveled for the area. This time around, my goal was to do things in order, but I didn't want to look up what that order was. I had a rough idea of the general order because again, I've beaten the game before, but I still was off. I tackled some Titans way too early. I took on some Team Star bases way over leveled, but the gyms I actually managed to do in order. So that was cool. Let's talk about the Titans first because I want to. There are five total Titan Pokemon you have to hunt down across your adventure. You have Cloth, Bombardier, Orthworm, Great Tusk slash Iron Threads, depending on your version, and then the Dondozo and the Tatsuguri pair. They're meant to be taken on in that order, but I ended up swapping Bombardier and Orthworm on both playthroughs. The Titans, I think, are the easiest out of your three main objectives. If I took on a Titan overleveled, I could one or two shot it, and I managed to take on the final Titan pair pretty underleveled without much of an issue. The Titans that I took on at the 
correct level would only knock out one Pokemon or so unless I was actually trying to swap around. I do wish the Titans were a bit more challenging, but also if you're not careful, you could easily make the Titans way too strong. If you want my two cents, I think if you increase the Titan Pokemon's health with out increasing their damage, it would make the fights more challenging without making them impossible for a Nuzlocke. With the higher health pool and in a Nuzlocke scenario, you'd have to go into the Titan fights with a bit more planning rather than just putting a grass type at the front for the rock type, putting a electric type at the front for the flying type. With this added health pool, if you were trying to Nuzlocke these fights with a strict level cap, you would have to think a lot more about your swapping order and what Pokemon you would be able to use. For me though, who was doing a pretty casual playthrough of the game, mainly just no items in battle, these fights were pretty simple, even when I went in under leveled. Normally I'm frustrated when Pokemon seems easy, but in this scenario, I don't mind so much. The fights are cool and kind of fun. The main reason I don't mind their light difficulty is because of the great story that follows each Titan battle. I mentioned a few characters while talking about the intro to the game, and it's time to bring one back up. Arvin, we met first after being saved by your game's box legend. He was the original owner of the Pokemon, but could never really deal with it, so after he sees your connection with the Pokemon, he gives it to you to train. Later in the school, you reconnect with him, and he asks for your help finding some Titan Pokemon and the fabled Herba Mystica that they guard. Arvin needs that magic Zaza. Smoke weed every day! Herba Mystica for you as a player is a post-game raid drop that you can use to create sandwiches that increase shiny Pokemon spawn rates, but Arvin doesn't tell you why he wants it at first. We all know he's gonna smoke that shit. We at the worst target on earth and I'm about to get my first blink ring. Cheers, my friends. After taking out the first Titan Pokemon and after your player character leaves, Arvin sends out his Mabostiff and feeds the dog the sandwich made with the herbs. As you continue to take on Titans, Arvin reveals to you that his Mabostiff was hurt in the mythical Area Zero and no healing items can fix the wound. In order to heal his dog, Arvin is setting out to find the Herba Mystica because it's said that eating all different types can heal anything. Some context. Area Zero is this place in the center of the map that is all clouded off. It's also off limits to pretty much everyone. Arvin was allowed in because he's the son of the game's professor, who we will talk about when we talk about Area Zero. This is also why Arvin just has a legendary Pokemon at the very start of the game. As you beat Titan after Titan, Arvin's dog gets a bit better each time until it's finally back to its old self. This story is sweet. Caring deeply about a pet is something tons of us can relate to, and so while the story is pretty simple, the payoff is cute and very nice, and it's easy to feel fuzzy when you see that happy dog. Arvin is the best written character in these games, and well, maybe all of Pokemon, but that's because of the stuff that takes place at the very end of the game in Area Zero and not so much with this storyline. This storyline is just nice and it's hard to say much more about that. Besides healing Arvin's dog, the sandwiches can also heal your box legend. See, when you first start riding your legend, that's all you can do. As you take down each Titan though, you unlock new abilities for your rideable legend. They are a dash, a high jump, swimming, gliding, and a climbing ability. These are all pretty much the abilities you had in Legends Arceus combined into one Pokemon minus the bear sniff. These abilities and your rideable legend are awesome. Better than running shoes, better than a bike, and better than the goddamn roller skates. I don't think it's the peak of movement or anything like that. That obviously goes to the Fortnite ODM gear, but riding your legendary is fun. It's honestly just as good as Legends Arceus movement, minus the annoying swapping around Pokemon bit. So overall, smoother. I didn't really care for rideable Pokemon back when they were first attempted. In Gen 6, they just felt like cheap gimmicks, and in Gen 7, I remember liking them a bit more, but still was kind of meh towards them. In Gens 8 and 9 though, I've liked them a lot more. I highly doubt we will always have a rideable main legend in future generations of Pokemon, so it'll be interesting to see how rideable Pokemon are attempted in the future. In all, the Path of Legends, that's what taking down the Titans is called by the way, is a nice quest line. It provides a cool introduction to some interesting new Pokemon, provides for a cool battle even if it's not the hardest fight in the world, has a connected story that provides for some happy feel goods at the end of it all, and it plants the seeds for the events to take place in Area Zero at the end of the game. Besides the Titan Pokemon, you have Team Star bases and the Pokemon Gyms. Let's talk about Team Star bases. Team Star is Scarlet and Violet's evil Pokemon team. In each Pokemon game, you have some type of antagonistic force. Typically, it's just an evil organization that wants to do something bad with Pokemon, but as the generations went on, some small changes were made to this formula. I'm mainly talking about Generation 8 and Team Yell. They're antagonistic for sure, 
but they're just a fan group for one of the other characters, so I don't think you can call them evil. After all, the main threat of the game isn't even them. Team Star took this change to the evil team formula and took it even further. This time around, Team Star has no evil goals. In fact, their plan was technically already a success. Team Star is a group of bullied students from your game's academy. The students formed Team Star in order to face their bullies together. They did exactly that, but the incident left the group as outcasts. They didn't want to disband their group, and so they decided to leave school together. When you start this quest line, which is called Starfall Street by the way, you don't know any of this. You just learn from a mysterious person named Cassiopeia that if you take down the bosses at each base, then the team will collapse. This Cassiopeia person is a mystery technically, but yeah, the list of possible people it could be is only Director Clavel and Penny. They're the only two characters you interact with while taking on these quests, and so the final reveal that it was Penny all along isn't that crazy. So why the hell would Penny care? Care about taking down Team Star? Well, she's their leader. She was the founder and the head of the group, so after everything went down with their bullies, as punishment, she got sent home to the Galar region for a while, but now she's back. She doesn't want her friends to get expelled for skipping class and for their Team Star antics, so she tasks you as a player to take down the bosses so she can save her friends. The Team Star code dictates that a leader must step down once they're defeated. So the idea is that if you can take down the core leaders of the team, the whole team will collapse. The hope is that with Team Star gone, the kids will return to school and stop kip skipping class. I'm not doing that line again. I don't fucking care. I've done it so many times. On paper, this plot and story is nice. It's nice to see friends care about each other. The issue I have with this whole Team Star plot is the way it's delivered to you as a player. Pokemon is going to be Pokemon, so instead of interesting storytelling, we get very static cutscenes that show the Team Star leaders talking. It's just animations and text boxes. It's either those cutscenes or in text boxes with Cassiopeia that we learn all of this story, and well, it does kind of suck for a delivery. The same criticism could be laid at what we talked about with Arvin earlier, but I think Starfall Street is hurt a lot more by this. With Arvin's story, it was much easier to get emotionally invested because of the low hanging fruit of a hurt pet being the focus of the story. With Starfall Street though, the focus is these characters and their stories, so the very static scenes hurt them a lot more. With Arvin, the animations are just as simple as the rest of the game, but we as a player can at least attach our emotions to the dog getting better, even if there isn't much actual improvement in the Pokemon animation wise until it's fully healed. With Starfall Street, Street, the level of storytelling needed for an impact is a lot higher. Here we have six new characters that the game wants us to care about. We have Penny and the five base bosses. Each of the base bosses have little personal blurbs like the fire lady and her relationship with the char cadet Charlos, but to me all of these personal blurbs felt like annoying fat that gave me brief gen 7 flashbacks. The game completely failed to make me care about any of these characters and their stories. It's a nice story to hear about these friends coming together, pushing through their adversary together, and then staying together to deal with the consequences that follow. But again, we just learn all of this through really static and boring cutscenes or through a text chat on your player's phone. The point I'm trying to make here is that Starfall Street was crippled by Pokemon being Pokemon. Pokemon has never been known for its story, with maybe a game here and there that are exceptions. Even the games that are more praised for their stories like Generation 5, I wouldn't exactly call masterworks of writing. Generation 5 is my favorite generation of Pokemon, and the story is definitely a part of that. Even still, I would never compare that game's story to stories that I really, really love, like The Way of Kings or Steel Ball Run. In Scarlet and Violet, the writing is improved from past Pokemon games, but the delivery is not improved at all. It's just as stale as the past Pokemon games. The way you choose to tell a story massively affects the impact that that story can have. For example, I'll take Steel Ball Run. Hey, no one needs to know. My girl's out running errands. We have plenty of time. Can I kiss you? Mm. 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 Honey, uh, you're home early. I I can explain, this is not what it looks like. For those who don't know, Steel Ball Run is part seven of JoJo's Bizarre Adventure. The story is incredible and the manga is one of the highest rated manga on my anime list. It's second actually with an average score of 9.3 out of 10. This story is almost 100 chapters and it's quite a journey to read. If you were to take this incredible story and boil it down to the most basic bits and plot and then put this 95 chapter masterwork into a 20 page picture book, the story would not nearly hit even close to the same. 
writing. I bring up this example because I think we're getting the picture book versions of these stories and it kind of sucks. The basis of what makes up Starfall Street is good, but the execution of that story is boring and plain. In storytelling, a very common thing to hear is show, don't tell. Instead of having a character say, Han Solo is a badass and cool guy, you can instead write in moments to show off how he is a badass and cool, like when Han Solo shoots Greedo first. Starfall Street doesn't show us anything. It only tells us shit. Each cutscene is characters standing around spewing information at the player. Whether that's Penny, Cassiopeia, Director Clavel, or the base's boss, it's just an info dump. Being delivered through text isn't the problem either. Novels can be fantastic pieces of work, but this is an info dump. I would have really have liked to have seen this story delivered in an interesting or cool way. For one, I wish they'd show us what the hell went down a year and a half ago. We know what happened. Team Star confronted their bullies and then their bullies left in shame, but that's all we get. We don't get a flashback to that moment or anything. I'm not even complaining about the graphics, by the way. Those cutscenes that I would have liked to have seen could have been 20 frames a second and filled with the simple animations that plague this game already. I just wish this story was delivered in a creative way at all. <laughs> Make me care about these characters. Show their friendships in a flashback show the big confrontation, and most importantly, make the story actually have an impact on the player. I really think this could have been done without bloating up the Starfall Street storyline. I'm not asking Pokemon to write a new Steel Ball run here. I'm just asking for an interesting delivery of a good story that they already have. One thing that I think would have really, really helped this storyline is voice acting. Look, it was gonna come up. It's 2023 and I am over reading text boxes for Pokemon games. It wasn't that big of a deal on the DS and 3DS because the system speakers weren't the best and I don't even think voice acting would come through very well on that. But come on, we've got Pokemon on the home console now. It is time for some voice acting, please. Scarlet and Violet have a lot of fun and interesting characters like Nimona, Director Clavel, the Professors, Arvin, and to a lesser extent, the Team Star leaders and Penny. I think these characters would have been so enhanced with some voice acting. Each of these characters are written well enough that you can get their personality and vibe through reading the text boxes, but having an actor amplify all of that through voice acting would just be way better. It doesn't even have to be the whole game. I'm just asking for the story focused scenes. I think this would have helped me care more about the characters in Starfall Street if there was voice acting. Also, we are of course going to talk about Area Zero, like I said, but I just wanted to take a second and say that all of my critiques laid at the game's storytelling lie mostly with Starfall Street and to a lesser extent, Arvin and his story. Area Zero's story is gas and its delivery is pretty good. That being said, that story element is hurt so much more by there not being voice acting. But we will get there when we get there. Are we there yet? 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 We will get there when we get there. Now, can you please hush? Sorry for being harsh. It's just been a long day, right? Yes, honey, I know. I need to be more relaxed with the kid. I get it. So we've talked through my thoughts on the characters and the story of Starfall Street, but I haven't even talked a little bit about what goes on in those bases. The bases themselves are really fun. I like them and they're a great gimmick for the game. I definitely want to see events like these come back in the future of Pokemon. When you first approach a Team Star base, you get a story dump, a grunt battle that helps you gauge the level you need for the base, and then you can start the base. The first phase of the battle involves you going through the base, taking on waves of Pokemon with the first three Pokemon in your party. Pretty easy to clear this section as long as you just spend two seconds planning it a little. You have 10 minutes to complete it and you can just heal up your Pokemon at vending machines. You could lose this for sure, but it's honestly harder to lose than to win this part. That's okay though. That's not a critique in this case. I like the opening section. It's kind of fun to send out your Pokemon to wipe away Pokemon after Pokemon. It's fun and a good opening for the boss battle that follows. Once you wipe out 30 of Team's 
Stars Pokemon, the base's boss comes out to face you. And yes, they ride a car. Each base boss has a typical team with a standard team a gym leader would have for that particular type of Pokemon, with the exception of the car they try to fight you with. Each leader has an enhanced Reverum as their final Pokemon. It's obviously very modified and it acts as a fantastic boss for these battles. These Reverum boast stats similar to those held by the Titan Pokemon, but in my opinion were always far more challenging. This is because by the time you reach the Reverum, you've likely exhausted a couple party members and have less resources to take it out with. If you've played dumb and used up your best resources at the start of the battle, you might just be in for a wipe here. For my playthrough, I was playing very casual, just no items in battle because that feels lame to me. Except for that one time where I got crit three times in a row, that was fucking bullshit. Uh, I did use one revive then. <laughs> For me, I think the team star bases have a fantastic level of difficulty for a casual playthrough. I was going into everything blind. Yeah, I'd beaten the game before, but it'd been six months and I most definitely did not remember the majority of those Pokemon teams. The one thing I did remember were the Reverooms rooms at the very end and their threat level was just as big as I remembered. I was able to pretty well gauge the level you needed to be for each star base because they all start with a grunt battle at the very beginning that kind of shows you the general level you should be at. I would then generally try to train my team to around that level before I took on the base. But besides that, I was doing no research into the Pokemon I would be facing. I didn't plan out the fights and I didn't really prepare that much. I was able to clear most of the bases on my first try, but a couple of those fights got close and the fighting base even made me wipe. The Reverum on each team boasts some powerful and threatening moves that will either do big damage, boost the Pokemon's stats, or decrease your stats. They also all have pretty decent coverage. If I played too recklessly and carefree at the start of the fight, I would usually pay for it when the Reverum came out. For the type of playthrough I was doing, I think the difficulty was good. With a hardcore Nuzlocke where you're doing lots of planning though, I could see how these teams could be easy-ish to navigate. I'll talk about the difficulty again later, but before we get to that conversation, let's talk about the gyms and their related topics. Hey babe, I'm off to the gym. I really do think you should come with me. No offense, but you have put on quite a bit of baby weight. All right, it's time to talk about the staple for Pokemon games, the eight gyms and your rival. First, let's get Nimona out of the way. Now, when I say out of the way, I don't mean that because I dislike Nimona. She's actually probably the best rival since Gen 5, in my opinion. I say get her out of the way because there's really not a ton to say about her. She doesn't really have a story. Her story is that she's in your homeroom, she's already a champion trainer, and she's absolutely horny for Pokemon battles. Nimona is a great rival though. Her energy and attitude will put a smile on everyone who plays his face. If you dislike Nimona, you're a psychopath and should be forcibly institutionalized. Nimona is a lot of what I like in a rival character. She's likable, not annoying, and she never overstays her welcome. In past Pokemon games, I'm looking at you, Gen 6 and 7. The rivals made me want to pull my hair out with how constant and annoying their presence were. Generation 8 was an improvement for me. I found the rivals in Sword and Shield to be significantly less annoying than the rivals in Gen 6 and 7. Here in Gen 9, things feel far better. Technically speaking, Arvin and Penny could also be considered your rivals, but I'm talking about your main rival here, and that's, that's pretty obvious who we're talking about. Generation 8 was similar with a few different side characters that could be argued as your rivals, but the main rival was very clearly Hop. Same situation applies here in Generation 9 with Nimona and the others. Nimona will pop up mostly at Pokemon gyms. She normally talks to you, gets upset that she can't battle with you or asks you to battle, and even sometimes introduces you to other characters in the game. The time you spend with her is always short, sweet, and normally ends with a smile. While she wants to battle you always, you only battle her a few times. I didn't find her annoying once across my second playthrough, and well, goddamn Pokemon, you get an A plus from me. That is the first time since Gen 5 that I haven't been frustrated to some degree or another with the main rivals. The gyms themselves are much more mixed than Nimona who sets you off on your gym challenge. Let's talk about the bad first. The gym challenges this generation are absolutely ass. They're not all the worst things in the world. A lot of them are pretty mediocre though, and the final few of them are just ass. You have no real gym puzzles that pass the level of mid. Some of the ones that I found kind of enjoyable were Iono's Where's Waldo game, but that was mostly because it was kind of cute and funny rather than a good puzzle, and the snow slope run, which I just thought was whatever, I guess. 
I planned to write three gym challenges there, but I looked over the others and yeah, that's it. Just those two made my brain go burr, but we're still both very brief. Some of the other challenges are the olive roll, a bidding war, and emotional support practice. I should mention gym five's challenge. I think it's the most actual puzzle-like out of the gym challenges. I still don't think it's great, but trying to figure out the ingredients for the secret recipe at least makes you think a bit. Another thing I found beyond disappointing were the gym designs. Each gym looks the exact same. They're all the same ugly ass building and it's kind of sad to see. Well, except gym five again, that one's a restaurant, but also it still has the same building anyway. Now plenty of Pokemon gyms all had the same outside look, but those gym designs at least didn't look like ass on the outside. Where gen nine's gyms are extra ass is on the inside. The inside of all of the gyms are the same. There's no design or flair applied to theme the gym at all. In general, there is no design or flair at all. It's sad. They're so plain. Each gym location does have a battle arena themed around the area, but it's not the same. The battle arenas too are pretty similar anyways with maybe a different paint slapped on things or a different set piece in the background. Okay, well, how about the good? Well, the gym leaders themselves I liked. They're all designed nice enough that I think a few of them could be stand users. The gym leaders also have some fun personalities. I'll even give Iono a pass for assaulting me with a TikTok dance because I liked her enough. I don't expect the gym leaders to be characters. In fact, with rare cases, they shouldn't be. Pokemon game stories would be way more bloated if they tried to make the gym leaders real characters. That being said, I think the gym leaders should instead act as great caricatures of characters. A caricature is where you take a trait in a character and you extremely over-exaggerate it. Glenn Quagmire from Family Guy is a great example of this. His chin and face are way caricaturized and so is his perviness. With Pokemon gym leaders, I think the caricature should be more personality focused than a physical feature focus like with Quagmire's chin. Take Iono for example. She is a caricature of a TikToker. She's over the top, dressed as crazy and looks like an e-girl. This kind of design approach helps the gym leaders be memorable. Let's look at fan favorite Larry. Larry is a caricature of your average guy. On paper, that concept shouldn't be that interesting, but because of the overemphasis on his average Joe personality and design, a lot of players related to him and liked him. Difficulty wise, I think the gym leader battles sit in between the Titans and the team star base leaders. I did wipe once or twice the gyms, but that was mostly because I went in under leveled. When I went in on par with the gym leaders, the battles could still turn out tight sometimes though. Let me remind you that I was doing a very casual playthrough of the game. All of my wipes were due to me playing stupidly and not paying any attention or not team building. Still, I think the difficulty for a casual playthrough like mine is good. On a Nuzlocke though, I can see a lot of these gyms just being sweepable. With that said, why don't we talk about the difficulty of the game? I've generally given my opinion on the difficulty of things as we talked about each of the three main stories. I found the Titans generally easy, the gyms were a more moderate level, and the team star bases were just above the gyms. Let me remind you for a third time that I was doing a casual playthrough. So while I'm sure a lot of the gyms or team star bases are sweepable with the right prep move, I didn't do any of that. My main criteria for my Pokemon that I used this time around were one, they needed to be Pokemon that I liked, and two, they needed to be generally Pokemon that I didn't use. I kept my team like that from gym to gym with only the occasional specific team change for an upcoming battle. I made swaps to my team throughout the run, but the majority of those team changes were made because I wanted to use that Pokemon rather than the change being the most optimal thing. Another thing that definitely made the game a lot harder for me was not evolving my starter. I know for a fact that Skeledurge can sweep large chunks of the game with Torch Song, and I wanted to have a bit more fun than just doing that at each gym so I kept my little Foy Coco. He's a cutie for sure, but also was clearly the weakest member of my team that I had. I tried to keep him a few levels above the rest of my team to try to help his stats, but even still, all I could ever do with him in a fight is take a hit, land yawn or flamethrower, and then get knocked out. Besides the main quest line, you have some notable boss trainers as well. Some obvious ones are the Pokemon League and the Champion, but you also get to battle each of your rivals once you complete their attached quest line. I think the League members are fine difficulty-wise for your average playthrough. For me, going in with no real team planning or specific team building did make a few of those fights close. Where the Pokemon League gets disappointing is the champion. Gita's team is something for sure. <laughs> To start, her final Pokemon and Ace is a Glamora with the Toxic Debris ability. I have no issue with this specific Pokemon or it being on her team, but the issue is that the Pokemon's ability is completely useless due to her sending it out last. The ability lays Toxic Spikes on the field when the Pokemon is hit. 
Those spikes will then poison your Pokemon each time you send a new Pokemon out for the rest of the fight. So why isn't this her fucking lead? With it being her final Pokemon, best case scenario, that ability is poisoning one Pokemon and maybe getting a turn or two of poison damage off. Seriously, this should have been her lead Pokemon and then they should have made King Gambit her ace instead. Besides Glamora and King Gambit, Gita has four other team members. These Pokemon are all considered mid by the majority of the community. Some of them have niche uses or can be good in some situations and use cases, but generally speaking, they're kind of underwhelming. All four of her final team members we haven't discussed yet are two stage or single stage Pokemon. This on paper isn't a bad thing. Cynthia, the most iconic champion, has mostly single and two stage Pokemon on her team. The thing that makes Gita's two and single stage Pokemon underwhelming are the Pokemon themselves. Cynthia had powerhouse single and two stage Pokemon. Spiritomb, Milotic, and Lucario are all major threats and powerful Pokemon. Gita gets things like Avalug and Go-Goat though. To be fair, the thing that carried Cynthia's team was definitely her Garchomp, but I still think the difference in Pokemon quality is clear. Spiritomb in Gen 4 had no weaknesses with its dark ghost typing. Milotic is one of the best and strongest and tankiest water types out there, and the water type itself is really good. And Lucario is Steel Fighting type, a super threatening type combination that is offensive and defensive, and on top of that, Lucario himself is a very scary Pokemon. Avalug on Gita's team has insane defense, sure, but it's also just an ice type and dies instantly to any special attack due to its pitiful special defense. Gogo is a grass type, so it has 10 billion weaknesses, and well, the other two aren't much different. I don't think Gita's team is the worst thing in the world, but it is an underwhelming and poorly structured Pokemon team, and there no doubt could have been a better champion team built with some different Pokemon choices. The reason why I'm not the most upset by Gita kind of being a mediocre champion is because of the real champion battle that takes place with your rivals and the Area Zero finale. Besides Penny's team, I like the rival battle teams. Nimona and Arvin's teams might not be the most threatening things in the world either, but they are fully built teams. Nimona's team is the hardest of the three rivals for sure, and in my eyes, she's the true champion battle. She might not be the champion of the league, but she's a champion ranked trainer, so she's beat all those bozos before. Her true team is better than all of them, so. Penny's team though, like come on, did you really have to be the bitch who's obsessed with Eevee? I like Eevee too, but like, come on. Make her ace an Umbreon or Sylveon or something and then give her a cool team otherwise. I was really excited to battle her because her music is gas, but then she throws out Eeveelution after Eeveelution and it gets pretty disappointing. The final battle in Area Zero, I'll talk about then, but to keep it simple, that battle is a fantastic finale. One thing that I find really frustrating about Scarlet and Violet and their difficulty is the removal of set mode. For those unaware, all throughout Pokemon, you've had the option to have your game played in Switch Mode or Set Mode. In Switch Mode, after you knock out an opponent's Pokemon, you're told what Pokemon they're going to send out next, and you're given an opportunity to swap into a counter for free. In Set Mode, the opponent's Pokemon just gets sent out, and you don't get a free Switch opportunity. This means you have to use your next turn in battle to swap and possibly risk taking damage. To make things simple, Switch Mode is easy and Set Mode is hard. With the removal of Set Mode, that means the entirety of Scarlet and Violet you're playing on Switch Mode. Sure, you can just hit B and choose not to swap out your Pokemon. I find this really frustrating. Sure, some might counter by saying, just don't use the free Switch. And yeah, of course I didn't. Shut the fuck up. I hit B. The thing that frustrates me is it's not hard to program a set mode like this into the game. Set mode was not removed due to time crunch. This was a deliberate choice from the Pokemon franchise and I don't like it. In the fall of last year, 2022, two former Nintendo of America employees stated that the company views Nuzlocking the same as they view ROM hacks. For those who don't know, Nintendo is not ROM hack friendly. A few days ago from when I'm writing this, so a few weeks ago from when I'm filming this and when you're seeing this, Nintendo took down a Nintendo Wii emulator. And just a month before that, Nintendo cracked down on a pretty popular YouTuber for the ROM hacks he was creating of their Nintendo games. I'm sure if I spent just five minutes looking, I would find dozens of stories like this from 2023 alone. Nintendo has a history of wanting you to play their games the way they want you to and on what platform they want you to. For whatever reason, they don't want you to play Pokemon with set mode anymore, so it's gone. You will never be able to convince me that this feature was stripped due to time constraints. The removal of this feature was nothing less than a deliberate choice. 
Why in the open world game where things should be the most free do they start stripping away those freedom filling features? Freedom filling features? What kind of fucking line is that? The Pokemon franchise has a knack at not including features that would make a ton of fans way more happy. Another example of this is the expert mode feature. In Generation 5 sequel games, once you beat the game, you can play them again, but on expert mode. This increased enemy Pokemon levels and added additional team members to major trainer battles. This wasn't perfect, it would be better if it was available from the start, but it was a really nice feature that gave you an additional level of control over the difficulty and the experience of the game. And well, it hasn't come back since. Why not? Seriously, it wouldn't add much time to the development of the Pokemon games, yet this feature was a one and done gimmick rather than becoming a series staple despite the positive feedback that the expert mode got. This is a deliberate decision to not include difficulty scaling in Pokemon games and now with the removal of set mode, one of the other few freedoms we had as a player is harder to use. Yeah, you can press B and just not swap Pokemon, but I don't like the direction that this step is hinting towards. I doubt they could ever implement a system to stop people from nuzlocking their games, but it does seem to me that they're doing what they can to make you play the way they want you to. Even in the open world game where things should be the most open and free, there is still a very clear path that they want you to approach the game from. Instead of including a level scaling mechanic that would let you take on any of the objectives in any order, they kept static level scaling. To be honest, the whole conversation of level scaling versus static levels is a big one and not one I wanna dive into on this video, but in my opinion, it would've made the game a lot better if you could've actually taken on the gyms in any order. You could have different teams for them depending on what order you take them on at. You can keep the same base Pokemon, but just scale the levels and maybe add or remove a couple Pokemon depending on what order you're taking on the gym at. It would have been really cool and it would have made these games a lot more interesting to play in my opinion. Was this bit too conspiratorial sounding? Probably. Who cares? Listen, honey, I need you to listen to me, okay? I'm telling you, our neighbors are out to get us. Our garbage can was moved by a couple inches this morning. That Paul wants us fucking dead. I'm not fucking crazy, don't say that. You are gaslighting me right now. I'm not taking these fucking pills. That doctor is a quack. You are the crazy one. All right, at this point, we've talked about the main chunks of the game and I don't think I can avoid this topic any longer. Let's talk graphics, lag, and bugs. Oh fuck, where do I even start? I guess with some background. Pokemon was 2D until generation six with Pokemon X and Y. I've been vocal in my past videos on Pokemon that I didn't like this change. I find the 3D models of Pokemon to look way worse than the 2D sprites. While I still generally feel this way, I do think Scarlet and Violet made big strides with the Pokemon models themselves. Legends Arceus was the first 3D Pokemon game where I didn't actively dislike the 3D Pokemon and that stayed true for Scarlet and Violet. Scarlet and Violet's graphical issues are very different from the issues I had with past 3D Pokemon games. Past 3D Pokemon games did look ugly at times, but they also had some beautiful areas in each game despite the limitations of the 3DS and its graphics. Sword and Shield were frustrating with their graphics for a variety of reasons, but the area's environments did look way better than Scarlet and Violet. We discussed how bland and barren the routes can be in Scarlet and Violet already, but we didn't discuss how the graphics affect this. So while you play Scarlet and Violet, it's clear that the graphics just aren't there. The textures constantly look like they're not fully loaded in, and the game looks like a Fortnite lobby that you're still loading into, but instead it just looks like that the entire time. The first day I played, I genuinely thought the textures were just out of focus and it would fix itself, but nope, that is just how the game looks, always. This does suck. The game is ugly a lot. I don't personally care that much, but if you ask me to describe the game, one of the words I would use is ugly. The environments were still criticized in Legends Arceus, but I personally think those environments were nice, but regardless of how you felt about them, they objectively do look better than Scarlet and Violet graphically. Another area that suffered greatly from the poor graphics are the towns. Every town is ugly and forgettable. I genuinely can't tell you anything about any of the towns themselves besides maybe the location of an NPC or two. 
The towns just have a few buildings, most of which you can't enter, and maybe a useful item or maybe a helpful NPC. The towns are all pretty barren in the game, and to make matters worse, they're all relatively bland with maybe one or two standout features like the town with a big windmill. The textures on the buildings are so ugly too. I didn't mind the poor textures with the open world environments as much because they're easy enough to just kind of ignore for the most part while you adventure around. But with the towns, a lot of times whenever I was in them, I was just constantly thinking about how fucking ugly they are. The one graphically nice thing these games do have is the terrestrialization dens and animations. These look good in my opinion, but they do bring up another issue that Scarlet and Violet struggle with. Holy shit, these games lag. So on my replay, my first play session recording was an hour and nine minutes. I checked my in-game playtime at the very end to compare it, and it was one hour and one minute. I was only playing Pokemon Scarlet while recording. This means that I lost eight minutes of my life due to lag while playing Pokemon Scarlet. I didn't do this for every play session because I knew the results would just be the same. This is a very widely known and very obvious issue with Scarlet and Violet. Check out this clip from Small Ant at the game's launch. I've played for 16 and a half hours, a little bit more than that. I've lost an hour and a half to lag. The game has lagged in 15 hours. It has lagged 90 minutes of it. Like that's how many frames we lost. 90 minutes worth of frames. Yeah, the lag is fucking bad in these games. There have been a few patches to fix some bugs here and there, but the core of the game's issues that were there at launch are still there. The bugs were definitely better though. I remember encountering multiple bugs every single time I played at launch. This time though, I only saw one or two bugs throughout my entire playthrough. So that's better. But the main issue with the game's performance and graphics is still there. I'll be honest, if you hate Scarlet and Violet purely because of the visual graphics, then you can piss off. Yeah, it sucks that the game looks like it's from the Nintendo 64 in a lot of cases, but there are plenty of old games with bad graphics by today's standards that are still enjoyable to play. Scarlet and Violet is still a Pokemon game, even if it's uglier than the past games. The core of what makes up Scarlet and Violet is fun in my opinion if you like Pokemon games, and I don't think the visual aspect of graphics ruins that experience. It does hurt it, and it does suck, and it definitely can pull you out of things, but it doesn't ruin the game. If you drop Scarlet and Violet though more due to its performance side of things, that I can much better understand. This game runs fucking slower than your grandma on a glue trap. There are constant lag spikes, loading screens are painfully long sometimes, and it's clear that the game just can't handle what it's trying to do. I should say, both times I've played on a standard Switch, not the OLED version, I'm not fucking rich. Not sure if that makes a huge difference or not, but I should mention that. The lag really does hurt the experience when it comes to playing these games. You can feel it struggle to get through every animation, and then even still, the animations look like corners were cut. Like for example, after you take down a Starbase, Penny will come by and give you your characters some supplies. Your box legend will hop out of their Pokeball and then proceed to assumingly lick Penny's face like they're a big puppy dog. We don't get to know though because the game pans up to the sky instead of animating anything. So many corners feel like they were cut. The school is another great example. Every room in the school is just disconnected and you jump between them using a map. Instead of designing a school interior where you could walk around exploring yourself, you're stuck with clicking a button, seeing a loading screen, and then you're there. Another example is in the intro to the game. It has some nice animated sequences and then just splices in shitty screenshots. Cut, corners. Look, I like Scarlet and Violet and I actually like them a lot, but all of the issues we've just been discussing do have a big impact on an experience and it could absolutely ruin someone's time with the game. To the average player who's more of a passive or neutral Pokemon fan, I can understand why they'd put down a laggy, ugly, bug-filled game and never pick it up again. It is better than launch day, but from my experience that was only in the bug department. It still runs like shit and the graphics generally do still look bad. With all that being said, I want to put on my boomer hat here for a second before we move on. God, I wish Pokemon had stayed 2D. While the Pokemon themselves look better in Scarlet and Violet, everything else looks worse. <laughs> How much of the game's issues come from it being rushed out the door versus it being on the Switch, I couldn't really tell you. In my opinion, it's a combination of both of these factors that lead to Scarlet and Violet being the way they are. There are pretty games on the Switch, but my personal favorite that I've played is Octopath Traveler. Octopath Traveler is a 2D RPG that follows a group of characters and their individual stories, and this game is so pretty. I can only imagine if instead of trying to force 3D graphics to work with Pokemon, if Game Freak had stuck 
stuck to the 2D style and just made that better. Imagine if we got a Pokemon game that looked as good as Octopath Traveler. 3D graphics do not instantly make a game better. For Pokemon, the move to 3D feels like a move that was made simply because it's what's modern and not because it would look better. Pokemon Black and White and their sequel games are the last 2D Pokemon games and they look better than all 3D Pokemon games in my opinion. Maybe I'm biased by my nostalgia on this point, but man I wish they had given up on trying to force 3D. Game Freak and Nintendo need to either put Pokemon on a system that can actually handle the 3D assets and make it look good, or just go back to the 2D art style. That's what I would prefer, but ultimately neither of those things are ever going to happen, so it doesn't matter. Pokemon is a money-making machine, and I highly doubt Nintendo is going to do anything different as long as that line keeps going up. I am part of the problem, and admittedly, I'm going to continue to be. I like Pokemon. Even with Scarlet and Violet's major issues, I still enjoy the games. We've discussed every major topic at this point except Area Zero, so why don't we speed run some of the smaller topics I want to touch on. Hey baby, look, you know I love you, but you can't keep calling my dick small and cute. It makes me feel emasculated. I don't really care if it's true, it makes me feel bad. Look, how about instead of calling it small, we call it compact. The first compact segment up is the new Generation 9 Pokemon. The new Pokemon are Gas. There's usually a significant portion of the fan base who hates all of the new Pokemon whenever a new game comes out, but I've never really had that problem. That being said, I think Generation 9 is the best set of new Pokemon we've had in a while. We already talked about the starters at the very beginning, but just as a quick refresher, I think all three lines range from pretty good to great. Past the starters though, we got Pokemon like Armor Rouge and Cerulege, Annihilate, Toadscrewl, Cloth, Palafin, Cyclozar, Satitan. The only Pokemon designs I don't really like that much out of the main Pokedex is Espothra. Even being said, I know there are plenty of Espothra fans out there. Some designs are kind of weak like Wiglet and Wugtrio being really lazy redesigns of Diglett and Dugtrio rather than taking a creative approach with the new form, but even with these Pokemon their worst sin is just being a bit lazily designed. The vast majority of Paldea's new Pokemon though I really like. Past the basic Pokedex we also got Paradox Pokemon this generation. Area Zero's plot revolves around a time machine and through this time machine Pokemon from the past or future are being brought into your Pokemon world. For Pokemon Scarlet it's Pokemon from the past and for Violet it's Pokemon from the future. Now I went in blind to the games originally and didn't look up any of the leaked Pokemon or Paradox forms to the best of my ability. I went with Violet and well to be honest I was a bit disappointed with the future Paradox Pokemon. I like them but they're all just kind of techie versions of their original Pokemon forms and that feels kind of lazy. They're all cool and I do like them, but I just wish they were a little more creative with their designs. For Scarlet's Pokemon, the bag is more mixed for me. Some Paradox Pokemon in Scarlet I really love, like the Slitherwing and Roaring Moon, but others I don't really like, such as the Screamtail and the Brute Bonnet. I think if I were to rank all the Paradox Pokemon, Scarlet's Paradox Pokemon would fill up the bottom and top of my list, while all of Violet's Paradox Pokemon sit in between. As a whole though, I love the idea of Paradox Pokemon. We've already got two new with the addition of Iron Leaves and Walking Wake, and I really hope we get a bunch more in the DLCs. The last group of Pokemon to touch on for Scarlet and Violet are the Legends. There are six legendary Pokemon in Scarlet and Violet. You have the pair of Box Legends, and then four other legendary Pokemon. These Pokemon are hidden around the region and can only be accessed once their corresponding stakes have been pulled from the ground. The stakes are scattered all over the region and you really have to explore to find everything. The legends themselves are kind of cool. I like them all, but Wochin's gotta be my favorite out of the four. I also didn't bother to find any of them again for this video, cause fuck that. What I'm about to say is going to make a friend of mine mad. I'm sorry, Bear, but I think I like Coridon more than Maridon. I went with Violet at launch, mostly because of the color purple, but I also liked Maridon more. As time's gone on though, I do think I prefer Coridon out of the pair. Also, I pulled this, so that's cool. Gold Coridon. Sorry, this isn't the script. I just like showing off my cool cards. Ultimately though, I really like them both. Also, I don't have the gold of Maridon, but I do at least have the full art, so. The Pokemon are given personalities throughout the game's cutscenes and you spend the entire game riding on them, so it's kind of hard not to like them. Next, why don't we talk about Terrastalization and Raids. Terrastalization is this generation's battle gimmick. It gives you the ability to change the type of any of your Pokemon. 
Each Pokemon has a Terra type assigned to it, and it usually corresponds with its base typing unless you catch it from a raid den. When you terrestrialize a Pokemon, it will change from whatever type it was to the monotype of your Terra type. For example, Tyranitar is Rock Dark, but mine was Terra Ground, so when I terrestrialized it, it became a pure ground type. This whole gimmick involves a really cool animation, and it gives your Pokemon a neat hat. The terrestrialization also boosts the power of moves of that specific type. This battle gimmick is really, really good. It is extremely versatile and it can almost always come in handy. For my playthrough, one of my core team members was a Sylveon I nicknamed Celeste Speedrunner. I caught them as an Eevee, so when I evolved them into a Sylveon, they still kept their normal Terra type rather than having a Fairy Terra type. At first I was like, well, this Pokemon will never get Terra then. But actually, there were many times where a Terra boosted quick attack saved the fight, or if I Terra'd to normal, it would help reduce damage from a super effective move and in some cases make me completely immune, like what I did at the Ghost Gym. I was able to terrestrialize my Sylveon in the Ghost Gym into a normal type, making it immune to some of the gym leader's best attacks. The application of this mechanic is definitely much more useful in competitive Pokemon though. So many big brain blaze can be made with this mechanic. It's honestly impossible for me to describe all of them because there are so many different scenarios that a specific Terra type could come in handy for. Any Pokemon can have any Terra type. You're able to get shards for the Terra types, and once you have enough of them, you can change your Pokemon's Terra type to that type. It is kind of a long grind to do this, but you can do it, so the point is that any Pokemon can be any type, and that makes competitive Pokemon super interesting. I haven't done much VGC, sadly, just because of life being life, but I do really want to get into it eventually, past the few ladder games I have played. If you want to catch a Pokemon that has a different Terra type than one of their base types, then you have two options, Static Encounters and Raid Dens. Throughout the map, there will be a few specific Pokemon that have special Terra types. These Pokemon will be glowing, and they'll terrestrialize at the start of the battle. There are only limited Pokemon that spawn this way though, and they do have a specific Terra type applied to them. Raid Dens are far more flexible though. Raid Dens spawn all over your map and will have a Pokemon inside with a Terra type that's displayed on the map. The Raid Dens themselves are super fun. They're similar to the Dynamax raids from Gen 8, and that's a good thing because those raids were also very fun in Gen 8. You have to build specific level 100 Pokemon for the raids at max level in most cases if you want to win. The raids also give you a ton of great drops like Nuggets, XP Candies, and most importantly, that sweet, sweet, Herba Mystica. Scarlet and Violet introduces the sandwich making mechanic. This mechanic allows you to create sandwiches with various boosts. Some help you catch Pokemon, some help you hatch or get eggs, but the most powerful sandwich increases your shiny spawn rates. For my replay of Pokemon Scarlet, I did not do any specific shiny hunting. I've already spent a month on this video and I didn't feel like adding an extra few days to that process by doing some horde hunting. Also, the video is very late, so I'm glad I didn't hoard hunt. I have, however, done quite a bit of shiny hunting in Gen 9, just on my copy of Violet. From my experience with sandwich boosted shiny hunting in Pokemon Violet, I can say that these games are some of the best to shiny hunt in for sure. You have a lot of really great items that can boost your shiny rates like the returning shiny charm or the classic Masuda method, but unique to Gen 9 is the already mentioned sandwiches and this generation's version of horde hunting. Every day, hordes of a few Pokemon will appear across your map. If you go and knock some of those Pokemon out, the shiny rates for that Pokemon will increase. Once you've knocked out around 60 Pokemon in the horde, your shiny odds are going to be way higher. Then from there, you just picnic reset the area or reload the Pokemon over and over until you get your shiny. When you combine this method with other methods, your odds are actually insanely high. You can get your odds to 1 in 512, and while that still sounds low odds, you're normally seeing around 20 Pokemon each time you reset the area. It's just a matter of time until you get the shiny that you want. Sometimes, hunts can still take a while, like when I got my shiny Finizen, I had to hunt that horde for almost 3 hours. But I'll take that 3 hour shiny hunt over the days of grinding that hunts could take in past generations with the much, much lower shiny odds. For my playthrough of Scarlet, I had my eyes peeled for a shiny as best I could. In Legends Arceus, shiny Pokemon would make a sound when they spawned, and that was super helpful. You could just cruise around the area, not paying much attention until you heard that sound, but sadly, they took that feature out in Scarlet and Violet. You might be able to get the most possible encounters ever in these games, but there is no free sound to tell you that one of them is shiny. There are many, many clips of streamers missing shinies due to this. If I already have Swift. You missed a shiny Lechonk? You're messing with me. No, there wasn't a noise. There's no shiny noise. We've been trying to tell you that. Wait, I don't care about the story. Wait, or did I just find a shiny? Swift. I already have Swift. Is that a? No! Tell me you're lying. I have Swift. No! No, there was a shiny. Oh, come on. 
It's very likely that you and I have missed shinies while playing these games due to this. Maybe you should rewatch this video 14 times and examine every single frame of my gameplay to check if I missed anything. Could be fun. Truth is, I was super nervous that I would miss a shiny while playing, and I thought I had because by the time I reached area zero, I was shinyless. For context, I got two full odd shinies while playing Violet. I was hoping to get at least one for my Scarlet playthrough. Sadly though, I continued to beat milestone after milestone without seeing any alternately colored Pokemon. I was kind of hopeful going into area zero though. You can see a ton of different Pokemon at the same time down there and Jumpluff are everywhere and I really like Jumpluff. My hope was that maybe the game would bless me with a shiny Jumpluff in order to cap it all off. However, as I made my way through area zero, the story took me in again and I forgot about shiny Pokemon until I saw something that looked off. At first, I thought it was the lighting, but soon it hit me and so did the adrenaline. That wasn't the lighting. That was a pink Dunsparce. I rushed at that Pokemon without thinking and didn't save before the battle. If I had saved, I could have reset the encounter if I fucked it up, but now this was my only shot. I really didn't want to miss the shiny because shiny Dunsparce is elite. I'm aware this wasn't the best Pokeball for this shiny by any means, but I needed to catch it more than anything else. So I threw a Dusk Ball, probably just slightly better than a Quick Ball. Thankfully, I caught it on the first try. For the record, this Dunsparce did have double edge, so it definitely could have killed itself in the battle if I wasn't careful. Now, for those who know anything about Gen 9, I'm sure you're wondering if I evolved it. Well, I definitely did. See, Dunsparce got a new evolution in these games called the Dunsparce. It's just a longer version of its base form, pretty much, and I personally really like it. It's stupid and idiotic in the best way possible, and I think it fits the Pokemon well. Sorry to anyone who wanted a big fierce dragon. The vast majority of the Dunsparce will only have two segments, but there is a 1 in 100 chance that when you evolve a Dunsparce, it will have three segments. This means that a shiny three segment the Dunsparce is one of the rarest shiny Pokemon in the game. There are shiny hunters who will sandwich hunt Dunsparce for days on end, just hoping and praying to get that three segment beast. So, did I get it? Yeah, I fucking did. I got the three segment shiny da Dunsparce at full fucking odds. This is honestly the luckiest shiny Pokemon I will ever get in my entire life. If you want the probability of two events happening, then all you need to do is multiply the probability of each event happening by the other event's probability. So for me, the chances of finding a shiny Pokemon in Scarlet and Violet are 1 in 4096. The odds of a Dun Sparse having three segments is 1 in 100. So when we multiply those by each other, we get 0 0.0000024, or represented in a much easier form to understand, that's a roughly 1 in 400,000 chance. Fucking insane. Insane luck. I can't complain about my luck in Pokemon for a solid year after this one. I personally took it as a good omen for the video, and I think you should take it as a good omen to subscribe. At this point, you're over an hour into my video, so you obviously don't hate me. Hit that sub button, please and thank you. Okay, we are very close to talking about Area Zero and its story. Sorry for blue balling you here by bringing it up. Before we get to that, I want to discuss the Pokemon Centers. Pokemon Centers are one of the few things in Pokemon that I feel like have consistently gotten better generation from generation without a backstep. That's kind of rare for Pokemon. With how long this series has been going, a lot of the features have a kind of mixed history at this point. The Pokemon Centers, however, don't have this. With all this being said, it's not like they're making leaps and bounds worth of changes between each generation and the Pokemon Centers. More to say that over the years, the Pokemon Center became a more streamlined process with smaller changes such as including the Pokemon Shop in the Pokemon Center. Each Poke Center would take the core of what made it work in the last game, maybe make a few small improvements, and then shift that core into a new shell for the next generation of Pokemon games. For Generation 9, there is no shell. The Pokemon Centers are just out and open and I'm very happy about this. For one, there is no loading screen for that building. We've already talked about the game's slow performance, and so if you added a ton of loading screens to this experience that take longer than they feel like they should have, this would have definitely really hurt the experience you had while playing. Instead, the centers are loaded in within the open world and you can just roll up, 
take care of your business and head right back out uninterrupted. While the Pokemon centers have very simple designs in these games, I really like it because the functionality it serves in the game is great. A new thing with these games is their crafting system. We had crafting in Legends Arceus, but things work differently in these games. As you play in Scarlet and Violet, you'll unlock certain Pokemon moves that you can craft TMs out of. In order to craft these TMs, you'll need crafting items from certain Pokemon. I think this is a nice crafting system. I know a lot of people didn't like this, and I think the criticism of not having access to TMs just because you haven't beat the milestone that allows you to craft that is frustrating, but overall, I don't mind this. This system also helped encourage the use of another new system. Pokemon battles can be kind of slow, especially if you keep animations on like me. So sometimes grinding out wild battle after wild battle isn't really something you want to do. To help with this, you can do raids for XP candies, but you can also use the Pokemon auto battle feature to help grind up your Pokemon. This is also the fastest way to get crafting materials for the TMs that we talked about just before. Pokemon auto battling lets you throw out your first party member and it will run around murdering everything that the Pokemon can catch. There are are catches to this. If the Pokemon your Pokemon tries to fight has a type advantage, then in a lot of cases your Pokemon will lose the battle and come back to you at half or even red health. This feature is nice. I, I liked it a lot. It's super useful for generally training up your team as you explore. I would frequently just swap around my lead Pokemon as I explored and then throw them out to fight a few Pokemon and move on. While you do get reduced experience from these fights, they go very, very, very fast and your Pokemon can move through crowds fast. In some cases, you might only have one Pokemon in the area that can stop your Pokemon's rampage and so it's legit just free XP to send your Pokemon out. It's a great alternative to the standard grinding and I did a mix of both types of grinding throughout the game. Also, while they did remove the shiny Pokemon sound, your Pokemon won't knock out a shiny Pokemon while auto battling, so that's nice at least. You won't have to watch your Meow Scrata charge down and then murder a shiny Sand Isle you just spotted. Okay, last thing before we move on to the finale of the game. The multiplayer. I didn't do any multiplayer for my second playthrough of the game, but I did back at launch day. For the first time in Pokemon history, your friends can join you in the overworld and on your Pokemon adventure. Well, kind of. You can't really do anything story-wise together, but the idea is at least cool. For me and my friends, we just really did multiplayer on launch day, and I've done it one or two other times after that. I didn't do a playthrough with someone constantly in my world, but I could see some people really enjoying that. Maybe you play the game with your partner or just a close friend, but sharing the experience of exploring a new Pokemon game with someone could definitely be fun. I'm glad it's an option for people who want to use it. I also think this feature would make a friend lock a lot of fun due to the in-world interaction you have with your friend. While I do find the multiplayer pretty bare bone, I'm glad it's here and I hope they keep this feature and improve on it in future games. This is asking a lot from Pokemon, but imagine if there was a two player mode that made every battle double battles that you and your teammate would have to take on together. I want to see that kind of shit with a multiplayer mode in the future, but for what we have here, there isn't much to complain about. It's a nice feature, even if it's basic, and it provides a lot of interesting opportunities for players. All right, it's time we talk about Area Zero. I honestly think that Area Zero is the best story we've ever gotten in a Pokemon game. I love Generation 5 and its story, but that story doesn't have the kind of emotional impact that Area Zero does. The entire time you've played Scarlet and Violet, you've never met your game's Pokemon professor. You've only spoken to them through the phone or computer screens. From here on out, I'm only going to refer to Professor Sada and not use this kind of neutral language because I don't want that to mess up the flow of the story. Just keep this in mind going forward that I'm going to represent everything from the Pokemon Scarlet perspective. Every time you took down a Titan with Arvin, your Coridon would get a new movement ability and Professor Sada would call you and speak to you briefly about the legendary Pokemon. Besides the mysterious Professor, Area Zero has stared at you the entire playthrough like a massive zit stares at a high school teen on prom night. Area Zero is pretty big and it covers the entire center of the map. You can get the ability to climb walls with your Pokemon, but even if you climb all the way up over the mountains, all you see is clouds. If you try to jump in, you're pulled back out. Finally though, after you complete all three storylines and defeat your friends in final Pokemon battles, you're allowed into Area Zero. Things set off when you and Arvin enter the professor's lab and get a message from her. She needs a book that Arvin has, the Scarlet Book, to be brought to her in the center of Area Zero. In order to do this, you and Arvin get help from Nimona for her battle skills and help from Penny for her tech knowledge. 
After a very much not safe ride down on Coridon, the four of you make it into Area Zero and Coridon starts acting weird. It won't come outside of its Pokeball now that you're inside the area. You and your friends move past this though and focus on the mission. In order to get to the bottom, you'll have to turn off four switches located at various labs throughout the zone. As you adventure to the first labs, you can take everything in. Yeah, the graphics are still Scarlet and Violet graphics, but damn does this place look good. The Pokemon that they chose to put in the areas also really fit in and add to the vibe. I really like that you can't ride your legend the first time through. It really makes you suck the whole environment in and I liked this experience even on a second playthrough. Another aspect that I liked about the whole adventure was your friends. Oh man, Pokemon, I am so proud of you. You have forced interactions with characters that didn't make me want to blow my brains across the wall. Well, uh, I guess I won't need this anymore. Not only are these interactions not painful, but they're actually nice and serve to help build all three characters. As you explore, the characters will chat with each other. Your player character knows everyone, but the other three all have various relationships. If you read these interactions, you learn more about each of the characters and watch a friendship grow between the entire group. The information we learn is mostly about Arvin due to his deep personal connection to the area and him being the focus of the story. These conversations also don't freeze the gameplay. There are a few things you can't do while the text boxes are up, but you can still explore and battle Pokemon if you want. This being said, I wish there was voice acting here so bad, especially for the climax at the very end, but even in these scenes, voice acting would enhance the relationships being built and the story being told by so much. It would even enhance the gameplay here because instead of reading the text while exploring, you could just listen to the characters talk and more fully focus on the cool environment around you. I'm not gonna harp on this again when we talk about the finale of the finale, but just keep this in mind while we talk about the rest of the area. There are some fan dubs out there of these scenes that I think really demonstrate how voice acting really could have made this game something so much better. But oh. <laughs> no need to be scared if we go together. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Does that logic work? Get, Get on! on! Anyway, I'll move on from that. As your group makes their way through the dangerous area, weird Pokemon start appearing. These are the Paradox Pokemon and a great way to introduce them to you. As you go from lab to lab, something starts to become clear. Professor Sada is definitely hiding something. She only answers certain questions and she outright ignores her son in a lot of situations. In fact, instead of asking her son to come help, she was asking for you. She addresses you the player and not Arvin and it's honestly fucking frustrating and sad to watch. It's clear that Arvin has some difficult feelings with his mother. This is understandable seeing the way she treats him while you play. She almost never acknowledges her son until near the end. This is all building up until the group reaches research station four. Inside, it's destroyed. It's clear that something bad happened here. To make things worse, the professor has gone from seeming like a bitch of a mom to now it's very clear that something is very wrong and there might be a reason for her cold attitude to her son. We eventually come to learn what's going on. Once we meet the rain research station that contains the time machine, your team faces off against more paradox Pokemon and eventually you enter the final lab alone. The other three characters ran off to help contain all of the Pokemon. Once inside, you learn the full truth. Professor Sada is not Professor Sada, but instead she's an AI built to replace her. We don't really learn the specifics on how long ago, but at some point in the past few years, the real Professor Sada was killed by the dominant Coridon living in Area Zero. It was attacking your Coridon, and the professor tried to jump between the Pokemon to stop the fighting, but was killed because of it. Because of this, the AI has been running things and continuing the professor's goals of bringing more Pokemon Pokemon back from the past. The AI wants to stop the time machine. It's recognized the danger that the past Pokemon posed to the modern ecosystem, and so it's tasked you to shut it down. The AI's programming takes over if it tries to shut things down, so it needs the player to take her down so the time machine can be turned off. This leads to a really fantastic final Pokemon battle against the professor as you try to shut down the time machine. She uses a team of the Paradox Pokemon, and once you beat that team, you're forced to face off against the dominant Coridon. Of course, your Coridon is able to pull through and win the day and it beats the professor. Here though, the AI professor reveals something. While she is here, her programming will continue to stop them from deactivating the machine. She needs to go. At this point, all of the characters have joined you and most importantly, Arvin has. They've all learned the truth about the real professor's fate. Arvin himself knew something was off for a long time, but it was obviously still really shocking and hurts to hear everything. To make matters worse, this AI built by his mom to be a copy of her now has to go again. She may not be Arvin's mom specifically, but a few hours ago Arvin thought she was, so this doesn't make this any easier for him. It's like he's losing his mom a second time in the same day. Professor Sada tells Arvin that his mom truly loved him 
and Arvin's response hurts. He says, you can't say something like that now. The dialogue between these two hits me harder than a pit bull biting on a newborn's head. It really shows off what Arvin is going through. Arvin is your friend and you've grown to like him as you've gone down the path of legends with him and taken on the titans. Your heart was warmed as you saw his dog slowly get better and the joy that it brought him. And now, you're watching the same friend lose his mom right in front of his eyes. It's rough, man. After her final farewell to the player and her son, the professor goes through the time machine and into the past, never to return. This lets the time machine shut down and ends our story. My god, Pokemon. You really had to do that to us, huh? What a fucking story. When talking about the story for a Pokemon game, you always have to add for a Pokemon game at the end of your statement. Like Black and White have a fantastic story for a Pokemon game. No shade at Black and White, again, it's my favorite generation, but you're kidding yourself if you say that that story holds a candle to a story like The Last of Us. This section though, doesn't need that caveat. Area Zero and its story does not need the caveat of for a Pokemon game. What we got here is a great story, plain and simple. You watch a character who you've grown to really like over the course of the game go through some really fucking hard shit, and it really hits. So that's Pokemon Scarlet and Violet. While I was definitely quite critical of the games, I wanna make it clear that I do like these games. Flaws aside, the core of what's here is a great Pokemon game. I don't think the flaws are excusable, but I also don't see a future where the fans can do anything about it besides boycott their favorite franchise. I will stop buying Pokemon when it stops being fun for me. But even for now, with the rough performance, ugly textures, and bland environments, Pokemon is still Pokemon. Look, if you don't like Pokemon, I don't think this game is gonna fix that for you. Also, if you don't like Pokemon, why the fuck did you watch this whole video? Thank you, I guess? For Pokemon fans, I think these games are worth your time and money, and I'm looking forward to what the future of Generation 9 has in store for us. Especially because a black and white remake is due this generation. I just hope and pray that black and white get treated better than Diamond and Pearl did. My wife loves me, right? She wouldn't keep asking me to take these if she didn't think it'd help, right? All right, I'm gonna trust her. Honey, you'll be proud of me. I took my meds like you've been asking. Honey? Huh. Huh? Guess I'll play some Pokemon. Hey! Thanks so much for watching. I really appreciate it. I tried a new approach with this video by trying to channel my inner Catechorus and Scott the Waz with this video, so I hope you liked it. If not, uh, let me know, I guess. <laughs> if you did like it, definitely like and subscribe. I could really use the support. I'm over halfway there to getting monetized, and I really want to hit that goal this summer, so all support is appreciated. Thanks so much, and have a great Don't day. Don't you worry, it'll be okay. Don't you worry, spit it, come, you make my life okay.